just let everyone know, I'm, my name's Nick, um, and I'm part of the advocacy team at Leukemia Care, and I'm your host for the day. Um, may I take this opportunity to introduce you first to Lisa, who will give a talk after Joanne's talk, so she can introduce herself to you, and then she can pass, pass over to um, uh, Dr Ewing. Hi, Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, I'm Lisa Daniels. Um, I'm a haematology nurse. Um, I've been in haematology for over 30 years now um, and been a nurse specialist at Gloucestershire um, Hospitals NHS for the last eight years. Um, I work within the MPN service as well as other aspects of the, the um, haematology team. So um, hopefully I can add a little bit of information for you today. Thank you, Lisa. Joanne. <laughs> Over to Thank you. you. So I'm Jo Ewing. So I'm one of the consultant haematologists at University Hospitals Birmingham. So I look after um, a, a very large cohort of MPN patients here in Birmingham. And I'm hoping today to um, give you a, a little bit of a uh, sort of fairly gentle run through of a, a broad overview of MPNs. So that, that's my remit. Thank you, Nick, for the invite into Leukemia Care because um, you do amazing work and, and work um, really closely with our patients. So um, it's, it's really, really good to be with you and to be able to deliver this. Um, I do have some slides that um, I will run through. None of them are um, sort of uh, critical, got a lot of technical detail on, but I think they just help to put things into perspective. So I'm going to just share my screen, hopefully, um, with you here. And um, you should be seeing that. So that's that's me, and that's um, where I work largely at Heartlands Hospital, which is on the right here. And that's our, our Birmingham full um, in Birmingham, just to um, focus on, on where I'm uh, practicing. But um, welcome all. Um, it is MPN Awareness Day, so this is a, a really um, good uh, time, really, to be sharing this information with you about MPNs. So I said I'm going to start sort of pretty gently, really, just to put things into an overall perspective as to what MPNs are and um, and, and and what they do and why we've got sort of such a huge variation in terms of how MPNs affect patients. So um, this is Cadbury's. So I'm from Birmingham, I couldn't do anything else but um, show you the Cadbury's factory. But this is just to show you, this is, uh, if you imagine this is the factory for your blood cells. So your blood cells are churning out blood cells, sort of millions of blood cells a day. And what happens is that the factory's got to decide how many to make. So in MPNs, there's, there's what we call a switch or a mutation that leads to a fault, causing the um, overproduction generally in MPNs of a type of blood cell and that can then lead to problems so if we think here here we've got crunchies but it's like if you have too many cream eggs that might be your red cells too many crunchy bars might be too many platelets this can then clog up the system so too many red cells platelets even something called fibroblast cells and um, which can give rise to the condition myelofibrosis these can um, either drown out the cells that the, the normal cells in the bone marrow or can clog up the system and perhaps cause clots. So, so that's the sort of the general sort of overview. And here you've got a close up of some, some of your blood cells. So the little spiky ones there, they're the spiky sticky platelets and they can glue your blood together in, in a clot, but you've also got the white cells, they're important, and then the red cells. And any of these cells can be affected as part of the spectrum of MPNs. So let's um, take that concept through to the blood and look at what can happen. So MPNs basically are under this umbrella. So it's an umbrella term that covers three main conditions. So, and I know that people listening could have one, any one of these, but um, I'll try to sort of just give a little overview for each for you during this um, webinar today. But too many red cells, that's called PV or polycythemia vera. 
too many platelets, the little spiky ones, that's essential thrombocythemia, and too much fibrosis or fiber tissue sort of clogging up the bone marrow, that's what we call myelofibrosis. So three main conditions. I am going to focus on those, but I, I do want to also acknowledge um, today and, and just for, for people that are listening that it's quite nuanced. Um, we, I will talk a little bit about how these can move between one another. The diagnosis can change, but also there are some patients that are, are diagnosed with what might be termed, say, um, MPNU. That's where you can't actually sort of fall down exactly on one of these conditions or even overlap syndromes so MPN MDS so so there are these sort of nuanced other conditions that um, sometimes you you may have as your main diagnosis and can make it quite frustrating because you don't actually have you know something that fits nicely into the booklets and 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 things that you can look up online so I am aware of that but but these are the three main categories and they are rare disorders but they do become more common in the population as, as patients get older. So the majority of my patients will be in more advanced years, but actually it can also affect young patients. So um, perhaps in 20s through to your 40s. Um, it depends. I suppose it, it always is, uh, depends where you are in your own life as to what you term young, but it can very rarely affect children. So, you know, it, it is very, very rare for that to occur, but that can happen. And the incidence, so the incidence is what we term the new cases that arise and we, we term this per 100,000 patients per year. So, so say, for example, in Birmingham, um, I I cover a population of around about, let's say, two million patients. So that would mean that over a year, I would expect to see um, 52 new PV patients, 34 um, potentially, if you look at the upper end, 34 ET patients, and then um, about 20 myelofibrosis patients presenting per year. And that doesn't actually encompass the whole of the um, MPN population, because, of course, patients with MPNs actually really do very well in terms of um, once their disease is controlled, they, they live for um, considerable time. So the prevalence is actually the number of cases present in the population. And of course, that's a much larger figure um, to, to encompass all of those that are living with MPNs on a day to day basis. So how would patients present with MPNs? Well, you know, there's certainly this risk of, of, of alluded to it, blood clots or thrombosis. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we prevent that. Some patients may have a large spleen. So they may, um, that's an organ inside the abdomen. So they may be aware of that. And the other thing that could trigger um, a, a referral or a blood count to see whether you have an MPN would be what we call constitutional symptoms. So I've, I've put a schema up there that kind of covers those. So ranging right through from um, fever and fatigue, feeling full, that's what satiety is, um, bruising, etc. So all of these can occur in patients with MPNs. Not everybody with MPNs has any symptoms at all. So some patients with MPNs really are, are quite asymptomatic. If you ask patients in some detail um, you know, what, what they've got as symptoms, then they will, um, uh, you know, sort of be able to um, vocalize, as in this schema here, some of the symptoms that are affecting them. The big one in the middle there, fatigue and tiredness, that really overlaps all three of the MPNs. But if we look at, um, for example, essential thrombocythemia, perhaps those patients might have a little bit more burning of their fingers or toes. Um, polycythemia varying T, probably more issues from blood clots than, say, myelofibrosis at the other end of the spectrum there, where patients get more bone pain, more spleen increase, so more abdominal discomfort, um, probably more weight loss um, and, and potentially night sweats. Polycythemia patients are, are, are patients that 
often have an itch, particularly an itch after showering. So um, that sort of getting out of the shower and just feeling like you've got some some patients describe it not even just as an itch, but as as like being rolled in nettles. So a, a horrible sensation, and most particularly on contact with water. So so you get these um, different symptoms, and you can see here this is a, a scientific study looking at those. So each little stroke on here is is basically a, a patient. Um, and then you can see that each patient down down the, the list of bars has put their their symptom um, severity. And so red is very severe and blue is not present at all. And so you can see that you know, considerable numbers of patients are in the, all in the blue pretty, pretty much and so don't have any symptoms. But you can see that spectrum of red and you can see how more patients with MF and PV perhaps have symptoms. And you can see that stripe in the middle where it says fatigue on all of those is a really common thing to occur in patients with MPNs. We use a scoring system. So we use this thing called an MPN10 score, um, which um, scores each of those symptoms. And your clinician will, will likely produce one of these every now and then in clinic, not at every visit, um, but to take you through and to record the symptoms and see whether there's um, any change in severity of those change when we start treatment. So let's so, um, move back to some of the other things that can occur with MPN. So some patients will present with clots. And so the blood can get quite slow, can get sticky and blood vessels can become inflamed. And of course, um, the blood needs to get right through from your arteries, through tiny capillaries, through your veins. And if it's sludgy, then it's not going to get through those blood vessels so easily. It's not entirely as simple as just how thick the blood is or how sticky the blood is. There is something about inflammation and what's going on in MPNs that puts patients at particular risk of blood clots. So higher risk of blood clot than, say, somebody who's got um, high levels of platelets or red cells for other reasons. So, so we do know there is, is that possibility. So... Moving on, that's sort of how patients may present and some of the issues that can occur. How are the conditions diagnosed and what tests might you have? Well, initially, it's usually a blood test. So it can be either um, usually a blood count that comes through the laboratory and we see that you've got a high level of blood cells. Um, and there can be many, many reasons for having a high level of blood cells, not necessarily an MPN. So part of what we do at the initial um review and, and assessment is to assess whether this is truly a, um, a, a myeloproliferative neoplasm. So we're looking to see is there evidence for that or could there be another cause? Looking under the microscope is really important. And so these are little blood films here that I've shown you. And we look under there to look to see whether there's any evidence for blast cells um, or these things called teardrop cells. They may push you now towards a diagnosis more of myelofibrosis than PV or ET. So that's a blast cell there. And once we've done the blood count and we suspect this, we may well do a bone marrow test. So this is a bone marrow test. It's done from the back of the pelvis bone. And most patients with MPNs will have a bone marrow test at some stage. And we spread it out into little particles like that on a blood slide, or we um, slice it into little chunks and the pathologist will look at that for you and can assess the, um, I mean, these look all um, to, to, to the um, untrained eye, just look like blue and pink or purple and pink dots. But to a trained pathologist, this is really important. They can look at these, what they call megakaryocytes. These are the cells that make platelets in your bone marrow. And they can look at these and they can um, subdivide them into cloud-like or whether they're forming clusters together so here you see they're clustering and whether they've got what we call staghorn nuclei so they can describe these and and basically um start to put together your full diagnosis and the other key thing is genetics so we do genetic testing so the genes are a code that builds that sort of basically codes the building blocks a bit like Lego. So if you've got an incorrect block, if it's a different color, that might not 
matter. You may still be able to, you know, run the little red car, even if it's got a little bit of yellow in it. But if you've got something that's completely different, causes it to be a different shape, it can then stop that function from uh, protein from functioning. And those proteins often give cells um, signals to tell them what the body needs. So it may be that you get a switch that actually changes the mutation alters the signal to the cell. So instead of slowing down and reducing production of blood cells, it actually increases them and, and causes the wrong signal. So here we've got Mr. Lego man again. And, and here you've got that broken signal, a single mutation, just one single change in a gene, one fault can alter that protein enough to, to change the way that it functions. And importantly, these are acquired mutations. So they're acquired during your life rather than something that you inherit. So they're not something that you can pass on to your children. It's not a hereditary um, disease, even though it, the, the genetics is so important and mutations are so important. It's something that changes as a switch. And the key one that we look for is something called JAK2. So JAK2 acts as a switch. And so um, normally, so on the left of there, it should, when um, something called EPO comes in, should come in and fire off that and cause it to make red blood cells. So erythropoietin goes up if you need more blood cells. So, for example, if you're low on oxygen, you need more of this hormone erythropoietin, it triggers your cells, make more blood cells, saying carry oxygen. But actually, in a JAK2 mutated cell, what happens is that the, the cell behaves as though it's got the erythropoietin in there all the time and just continues to make blood cells. So, so that's what happens with JAK2, say, in polycythemia vera and a similar thing for essential thrombocythemia. And um, you know, the majority of patients with, um, say, polycythemia vera will have a JAK2 mutation, and probably about 50% of patients with ET will. It's called JAK2, it's called the Janus kinase, and it's called the Janus kinase because it's got this sort of two-faced appearance, so that the actual protein itself um, is like the Janus god of beginnings or god of gateways, so that's why it's called the JAK2 to the Janus kinase. But not everybody has that. So these things called driver genes can also be Cal-R or MIPL. So you may have one of those. Some patients have no genes detected um, and, and that's that's fine as well, but it makes it a little bit more tricky um, to, to come down to the diagnosis sometimes. And we're really very dependent then on the bone marrow appearance. So Segwaying very quickly into treatments and doing a little run through um, of treatments for you here. So what treatments are available? So aspirin is a real key and that's really for pretty much the majority of patients will be on aspirin. A few patients may not be with myelofibrosis. And a few patients may not be who've had bleeding problems, but in general, aspirin reduces the risk for blood clots and it is really important. So you know, having too many blood cells in an MPN is similar to, to the effect of, say, having smoking or high cholesterol, um, high blood pressure. So it's important to control all those things as well. Obviously, age you can't control, but um, diabetes can be well controlled. And then patients should, um, you know, have good exercise and weight control, etc. So all of that helps to reduce the risk of blood clots along with aspirin. If we come back to talking PV, well, one of the things that we can do is to reduce what we call the hematocrit. So what is the hematocrit? Well, the hematocrit is that proportion of cells that are your red cells as compared with your plasma. And so importantly, in patients with um, PV, what we do is we reduce that actually to a little bit below the upper end of the normal. So you'll see 48 percent or 4, 0.48 and 0.52 in men is, is what we term a normal hematocrit. But actually what we do for polycythemia vera is we take it from um, that middle um, tube there where you've got too many red cells. We don't take it down to anemia, but we take it down to this ideal hematocrit, which is at sort of 45% of your blood is, is formed of those red cells. So that's what your hematocrit is. Um, and we take that down to 45%, generally by taking some pints of blood off. So 
um, this thing called venisection or phlebotomy goes right the way back to um, you know this uh, this is a uh, the fifth century BC where we've got a picture of this on the Grecian vase so you know reducing that hematocrit is important so you may do it by phlebotomy or you may use tablet treatment and and the but a few examples there, which I'll just come to a little bit again at the end when I do a resume of all of them. And we know that this reduces the blood clot risk um, in certainly this study here, which was really critical, the CytoPV study, showed that you reduce the blood clot risk from 2.7%, um, from 9.8%, sorry, down to 2.7% with really good hematocrit control. But what about those patients that are listening that have got essential thrombocythemia? So this is where you've got too many platelets. How do we decide how to control the risk of blood clots in those patients? And so what we do is we do a score. So you can see here if you're low risk, then you've got a thrombosis risk annually of about a percent, one in 100. But if you're higher risk, then that goes up considerably. So you've got uh, about a three and a half percent chance of having a blood clot per year. Year. So it's important to control the platelets and do what we can to prevent that as well. We do have to be aware, though, that patient platelets can have other problems. So sometimes you can get bleeding, even though your platelets are very high. Actually, you get um, what they do is they stick to this thing called von Willebrand's and they um, they kind of uh, remove that so platelets can't stick. They need von Willebrand factor to stick. And so sometimes they kind of mop that up too much. And so we have to control the platelets um, rather than the blood clot risk in a few patients. So how do we decide in ET? So we again, we do this risk stratifying. So we decide whether you're high risk. Um, so anybody over the age of 60, or if you've already had thrombosis or a bleeding event, or if your platelets are over about 1,500, then we would think that would be a high risk of blood clots and thrombosis or bleeding. And so you would um, fall into a category that would need the platelets to be reduced. At intermediate risk, then that's less so. That's between 40 and 60 years with no risk factors. Um, and we also bring into this something called the, the JAK2 that I've spoken about, because if you have JAK2, then you're at higher risk of having thrombosis than if you don't. So we, we, we would assess and, and decide whether to, to start. So what are the therapy options? So um, I've put them here. You'll see one really, really highlighted at the bottom there for polycythemia vera patients, which is um, is something that has just come through today, which is really exciting news for the MPN community. But if we look here in essential thrombocythemia, we've got drugs like carbamide. That's a, a very mild um, chemotherapy agent. Anagroline just controls the platelets and when they were looked at head to head, hydroxycarbamide won out over anagrolide. So we tend to use hydroxycarbamide in first line or sometimes um, interferon. So we use something called PEG or pegylated interferon plus aspirin. If we look down myelofibrosis, if you have myelofibrosis, there are a host of things that we would potentially use. So sometimes drugs like hydroxycarbamide. But the real key for myelofibrosis patients is a drug called ruxolitinib, which we would use if you were higher risk. So if you're intermediate to or high risk of myelofibrosis, we can use ruxolitinib to control partly symptoms um, and, and give other benefits as well. For dratinib, we can use if ruxolitinib doesn't work. Erythropoietin helps to support the blood and the red blood cells. And you can also use interferon. Stem cell transplant can be important for younger patients that can um, access that, but it's not always um, available if, if you're um, unfit. It's, it's something that really is, is uh, you have to be fit enough to go through. Um, and then, of course, there are clinical trials. Um, and some of the other things I've not mentioned there, in, in view of time, but are used more rarely. And then if we move to polycythemia vera, so up until today, 
the treatments for polycythemia vera in the UK have been really based around similar things to ET, so hydroxycarbamide, using low dose aspirin, pegylated interferon, and venous section or phlebotomy. But um, we have just had the news and announcement, which is a fantastic thing on MPN Awareness Day, that NICE have uh, actually. Um, undertaken a technology appraisal for ruxolitinib for PV patients who are failing on hydroxycarbamide and they have actually approved that today so that has been a really difficult road and we, we've been hoping upon hope we've done considerable amounts of clinical trials looking at ruxolitinib to see the benefits for patients in polycythemia vera and now hopefully that will be something that we will now access in clinics for those patients that may benefit from it so really exciting news just today so very pleased to share that with you Dealing with anemia, so this is when um, the red blood cells are reduced. So more, most particularly in myelofibrosis, we can use these things to stimulate the um, blood and the red blood cells to try and deal with anemia or anemia rela re relating to treatment. So what about the outcomes and the outlook for these conditions? Well, ET and PV have a very um, overall good prognosis, but they can switch, they can move and change to myelofibrosis. So in approximately 10 to 20% of patients that can take decades um, before that happens. And all of these conditions can progress, and so they can change towards an acute leukemia. So this progression is something that um, we really need to be looking at and um, aiming to tackle with ongoing clinical trials and looking at whether we can prevent this from occurring. I would say that overall prognosis is very, very individualized, and, and certainly it's something that if, if you do want to know more about your own individual prognosis that's something to discuss with your um your own consultant and, and team um if they've not already discussed that with you so i've put here so this this is a uh is a partly taken from um, a group that's have been looking at some of the things that you can do, the sort of the things that you can do to try and help with some of these symptoms that we've discussed um, and, and to reduce, again, your risks of stroke and blood clots um, overall. So and I've spoken a little bit about lifestyle things like smoking and things. But in order to feel well with an MPN, then there's certainly these um, sort of recommendations. So exercise, particularly stretching exercise, walking, um, swimming can help, but yoga and that, that type of thing, reducing stress, um, some things like mindfulness can help, um, good diet. And so um, the team at MPN Voice who um, also are a charity supporting patients with MPN have um, a recipe book that's been produced by patients um, with recommended diets. So good diet most of the time, you can staying hydrated and reducing computer screen time and things. And certainly Lisa, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to sort of um, tell us after I've finished in a second or two um, about what um, the nurse specialists can do to sort of help with some of these um, issues that patients may have. So summary, PV and ET, disorders with normal to near um, or near normal life expectancy. They do share many clinical features and symptoms, um, which we try to ameliorate with the use of, um, of treatments and, and other interventions. We aim to reduce the risk of blood clots um, and the risk of thrombosis is determined, um, determines the treatment plan that we make and in myelofibrosis really no two patients are the same so it's really very very variable um, clinical features can vary a lot the outlook can vary so it's very very individualized in terms of discussion around um, your own care if you have myelofibrosis um, and we take into account um, what called prognostic scores, symptoms, age, and we use JAK inhibitors such as ruxolitinib and fedratinib that I've mentioned. And only a small minority of patients are able to have an allogeneic stem cell transplant. So, 
so that's my summary. So many thanks to Leukemia Care. And um, I will hand over now to Lisa. Apologies for the noise in the background. Thanks, Joanne. Um, somebody desperately trying to get hold of that's terrific. I did you talk. Um, I'm sure we might, we have a few questions in. Uh, just a notice to people in the audience and for the recording when people do view the recording. Unfortunately, due to technical areas, um, people who are in the Facebook group haven't been able to receive the streaming. I think there's been a Zoom update according to our IT colleagues who are looking into this. So just to let you know. Um, please, over to you, Lisa, um, if you'd like to. Okay, share the supportive care and the clinical nurse perspectives? Yeah, certainly. So um, I'm aware, obviously, when I talk through um, about my role and, and how I get involved with patients with MPN, that all clinics run differently. Um, services are very different across the country. So um, it may be that people need to access support in, in different ways, the ways that we do. But I thought I'd just give a flavour of what my role is like, um, talk about some of the typical things that we may help with. Um, and then obviously happy to help with any questions, et cetera. So uh, thank you for the overview there, Joanne, that was great. Um, so I get involved with patients um, from the very beginning. Um, I'm in clinics when patients are getting their new diagnoses, um, going through their diagnostic tests. Uh, we do some of the tests, so we're involved with some of the clinical procedures like bone marrows, et cetera. Um, but I'm really around um, initially to make sure I'm there for uh, sort of education and support services for patients and their families from the very beginning. Um, so initially, obviously, we focus on them understanding um, all of the things that Joanne just talked about, um, how your bone marrow functions, what the symptoms are all about, why you've got them, um, understanding your diagnosis. Um, and starting very early to try and encourage people to self-monitor. So the MPN 10 score sheet that Joanne shared um, is a really useful tool. We like to use that with patients so that they've got a very clear way of documenting their symptoms um, and, and that enables them to communicate them nice and clearly with us, but also identify when there are changes coming so that we can see people uh, back in clinics if they're noticing um, significant changes. Um, we'll make sure that people have got access to plenty of written information or online. We use um, information from uh, Leukemia Care from yourself, um, quite a lot from MPN Voice that Joanne's mentioned already, um, and any other sort of local charities, uh, just again to make sure people have got uh, written information to go back to. Uh, once we've kind of got uh, patients to get their head around what's going on and what their disease is about, then we'll move on to talking about treatments. Um, those are obviously, as you've seen already, quite varied. Um, so we'll help guide patients through what their treatment options might be. We might need to talk to them about um, trials that are available, whether people want to consider going on to a trial, what that might mean, and onward referral to the trials teams. Uh, but also understanding what their medications and treatments might be like, what life on treatments going to look and feel like. Um, we'll make sure that patients um, understand their therapies before they start treatment and we're involved in consenting patients to, to go through their process as well. Um, and then we sort of hand them back into the medical clinic to get onto their therapies. Uh, following that, um, I tend to stay involved with patients all the way through, really. Um, that's very variable depending on um, how much input people need. Um, we'll be involved in the monitoring and adjusting of medications, managing of side effects. Uh, we also run a helpline so patients can access us via a nurse specialist helpline. Um, it's only at office hours, but we do have sort of an acute helpline out of hours, but our patients are able to come back to us directly, which um, I think they find really helpful. They've got queries or questions in between or running into side effect or symptom problems, then they can get hold of us and get some fairly quick advice. Um, ongoing support, there's quite a lot available now, much more. I'm pleased to say our team's growing quite quickly. So um, there's two of us as nurse specialists, but we've also got a healthcare um, support worker that's um, funded by Macmillan. Um, so we will, at a time that's right for a patient, um, offer um, holistic needs assessments. So those are, uh, again, tick list documents, but are very helpful in terms of helping patients identify what we can actually help with, because uh, we can offer a, a quite a wide variety of support and signposting to services, uh, but also enabling us to sort of target things to those patients who have got particularly high needs, for example. So I can involve other colleagues to help with ongoing support in terms of things like finances, um, social issues, etc. Um, 
other than that, ongoing work, um, as Joanne's uh, slides showed, really um, focuses around the high sort of um, symptom burden that some of these patients can have. Um, and an enormous amount of my time is spent managing and talking about fatigue. Um, it's by far the most common and disruptive symptom, I think, um, that a lot of the, the NPM patients get. Um, and it's a very difficult one to, to treat and manage. Um, it, it takes time, um, a lot of time, um, to understand fatigue, to work out what makes it worse, what can make it better, what things you can put in place. And it takes a, an awful lot of adjustment for people. Um, and I think that adjustment also um, requires um, a lot of psychology support. So, again, our teams are level two psychology trained in all of our CNS um nurses so we're able to give a, a reasonably good level of input at our level um, in terms of helping people to adjust to um, what effectively is chronic disease and the impact on their lives um, but we can also refer into specialist um, psychology services if those are needed so um, you know quite a wide variety of things that we get up to um, I'm also one of the allograft transplant coordinators because I work with wow. acute leukemia patients. So if any of my patients unfortunately do progress um, to the more acute leukemic side, then um, I stay their key worker um, and I also look after them before uh, referral to their regional centres for transplants. Um, and I look after them when they come back and I'm again around for rehab and um, onward support um, and signposting in terms of helping people um, adjust to the changes that can happen after transplant and the rehab needs that they have. So I guess my main message is that we're there for patients. <laughs> um, we're there for initial assessments. We're there to help with problems. Uh, we want to make sure that our patients understand their diseases um, and that they're accessing the appropriate support at the right times. Um, everyone should have access to a CNS. I'm aware that not many people do uh, you know it can be quite variable some people don't get enough access or don't get it quickly enough or not early enough uh, but there should be somebody available for you but um, charities like yourselves are fantastic in filling those gaps and providing an enormous amount of information and support as well so um, you know if any patients or people out there are, are struggling without any additional support I'd, I'd definitely recommend that you contact the charities. So, um, yeah, I hope that gives you a little flavour of, of what we can offer. Lisa, thank you. And um, I see some comments in, in, in chat uh, straight on that point with regards to um, um, people not getting either immediate or maybe not getting access to a sooner. So just, just mirroring what you've just said there. Um, I've got some slides at the end that I'll run through to share um, leukemia care services. But please always do contact the charity if you're struggling to find information um our advocacy officer who's also on the call today in, in the support capacity is there for you to be able to help connect you with um, those in your healthcare team that might be able to help you i mean <clears throat> i was going to say from that point i I'm unclear about how myself how how different mpns are managed but um, I don't know if you've got any comments on this, Joanne, as to who the key worker might be. Might that you be be you as the haematologist, or might that um, tend to be somebody in the nurse nursing team and uh, clinical nurse staff supportive care team? I think we, I think we work, we work in in conjunction, so yeah. it will very much depend on the the needs specifically of the patient at the time and what exact question is being. Um, asked at the time so um, I would say that from my perspective so I, I work with uh, my nurse specialist Julie Saw. she's um, really instrumental in being able to sort of field a lot of the questions um, that that she can tackle um, and and then if there's anything at all that strays into um, sort of medication or um you know sort of changes in things or that then sh she will be straight in contact with me so so we're constantly sort of emailing um backwards and forwards about diff different things anything at all that's that needs sort of a consultant opinion um then obviously i'm i'm there but um so it really is a sort of a, a, a dual-headed 
um, approach really with CNS and, and myself. I guess in smaller units, and I'm very lucky that I work in a very large unit and I'm very specialised in um, MPNs and, and I also look after CML, but those are my main specialisms. So we can work very tightly as a team. Um, so um, that in, in a smaller department, perhaps where your consultant haematologist is looking after not just MPNs, but a whole lot of other things, and you may not have a specific myeloid CNS. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they may be sort of stretched. And I mean, I have to say that although it's an advantage in working in a very large department, actually, that can be a disadvantage because our nurses are, are doing an enormous amount mm -hmm. of work and, and, and are, you know, sometimes somewhat inundated, I would say, um, in terms of, of what they're dealing with. Um, but they will do their absolute utmost to get back to you with any answers to queries, questions. So often it's just a, a sort of a, a quick small thing that somebody's asking. Sometimes it's a, a concern. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we work in, in conjunction, I would say, very much so as a team. Thanks. That's really reassuring. Ticket. I'm going to ask a personal question from my side, from an ignorance point of view. How, how What's your link up with primary care with the GP? Um, are many managed in the community by the GP? Um, uh, you know, from a monitoring point of view and a blood test, I, I'm leading into another question because we have had a question yeah. about how, you know, uh, how can I expect to be monitored in 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 the in, in my future? And a question about how different NPNs are monitored. Yeah, yeah. so so I would say that um, pretty much um, we take on the monitoring um, of patients with NPNs in in their entirety. And again, if tests are done through the GP and there's a query on those tests that usually will then come from the GP back to me or if they want to start saying new medication and want to check that that's okay then that that can also be something that you know GP tends to sort of contact us just to to check on those things but we would we would take yeah. on the monitoring and pretty much the prescription of medication. We do have a few local GPs that will prescribe hydroxycarbamide, but the prescription of all of the medication is falls underneath the umbrella of the hospital. So, um, and so we need those blood test results. Some patients may be able to actually take their form and have their blood checked at their GP practice because they've got a phlebotomist there. But I would say um, general practice, um, in terms of what they offer for that is very variable. So each individual patient was, will be dependent on what the GP can offer. But we, we generally do all the blood tests at the hospital for patients and then arrange, you know, either delivery of medication or collection of medication as needed. So, so again, it's, it's, you know, sort of individualized in terms of the monitoring. We have moved um, to, to, some degree to telephone clinics so our nurse specialists have been doing telephone clinics for a long time but now clinicians will also be able to offer telephone clinics which actually suits a lot of people they don't have to park they um, don't have to you know hang around waiting in a waiting room it's you know I've, I've phoned patients when they're out in their caravan in Wales or you know on the on the Algarve or you know so it, it's various various issues so it can actually really suit patients and I, I'd say it does mean that more patients can keep to their appointment and, and that we get fewer patients that don't attend appointments because of that sort of ability to, to contact and telephone. So I would say most MPN patients will be seen around every three months. That's not a hard and fast rule, but um, once stable on medication, then it's about every three months. But in the first few weeks of treatment then often I would see a patient more frequently or if I've changed medication because you just want to pick up any side effects of medication and any other other issues that that could be occurring. Thanks. I'd, I'd say we've got very similar setup so we've yeah. got a specialist MPN clinic again we're very lucky uh, we've got consultants and nurse specialists that work and nurse practitioners and pharmacists actually now as it's grown and grown um, and our 
experience with GPs is very similar. So we've got a few very rural GPs that will occasionally take on doing some venous sections for us. But um, most of the time, again, our GPs will prescribe um, medications as long as we've asked them to. Um, but but we do all of the uh, medication adjusting, um, um, blood test monitoring, etc. Exactly the same. Thanks for the, yeah. You kind of answered three in one there, and you led into the frequency question from you know uh, a question we've had for you know for people's expectations from a monitoring point of view. I just wanted to answer you know. I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, but um, you know access to CNS is always very important, and it's something that's now been declared. I think in the new national health um, strategic plan again, um, and. I think this is something the charity will be focusing on again um, as well as we move into new campaigns. Um, we we did run, I think, in 2017, 2018, My CNS Matters. So I think there's going to be a lot of voice again behind trying to increase your numbers. Lisa. We certainly we certainly need that. We are very much inundated and our roles have changed so much. You know, I've been a CNS and, and worked within haematology for a very long time and my role has shifted so much. You know, we're expected to do prescribing and, you know, all sorts of different things now. But that means that some of the, you know, the, the contact, the the less medicalised part of our roles is just getting harder and harder to cover everything. And, and I'm pleased to say we're doing well in so many of our disorders. We've got people living with us for so much longer, but it means that our numbers these days are phenomenal. Yeah. Our MPN list, our MPN clinic is huge, absolutely huge. So trying to offer some sort of meaningful, regular contact, trying to work out ways of making sure that people can access us you know when they need us nice and promptly lots of information at the beginning but they're not disappearing and actually giving them some regular meaningful contact it's um it's pretty difficult to establish and maintain that actually so um yeah any any help we can have to to double us up and uh, get more of us would be much appreciated <laughs> we've definitely got your back and we're listening to our patients as well and that's something we are massively going to be advocating for and continuing to because um that's something that at least has been recognised by the NHS and they've actually um, rec recognised that in their latest statement, I believe. Yeah. Um, there is a question, a technical question, jo Joanne, in, in the question with regards to somebody um, who's very pleased to hear your news and was asking about venisection. Um, um... Yeah, so I can, I can see that one. So, um, so a really difficult reaction to hydroxycarbamide. So obviously that's not not appropriate. And um, patients with autoimmune conditions probably um, are, are less likely to use drugs like interferon for those patients. So it may well be that roxletinib could be um, could be an answer. Um, but certainly venous sections. I think it's just that venous sections to continue to keep the hematocrit at 45 yeah. is really critical um and that you know that although there's this sort of cut off that 60 cut off and and we start cytoreductive treatment often at that point you know there's, there's not an absolute sudden cliff edge that we fall off at 60 hopefully um it, it's a it's a kind of continuum so it's that sort of beyond 60 the risks are increasing but it's not an absolute you know one day you don't need treatment the next day you suddenly need treatment so there is time to sort of have those discussions and move towards treatment and look at the best treatment so hopefully over the next um couple of months then um you know the pharmacies need to get uh, into things we need to look at the kind of correct commissioning and things but now that we've got the nice approval then certainly um, hospitals and trusts will be moving to be able to prescribe roxalitinib for patients with PV who, who are not doing well on hydroxycarbamide. Thanks that's all very positive news today I've got a couple of provocative questions that we haven't answered somebody's raised the question uh, Oh, that, well, we, we can lead to that one. Um, we could actually start with that one if we wanted. Is there any advances in research and into understanding the causes of LPN? Yes, so that's that's a really good question. So, and and one that um, I I I think I I meant to put a slide in about that actually. So, um, 
so yes there, there really is research and, and that's coming partly again through um, charitable funding so MPN Voice are actually funding um, a project called the Mosaic project and so that is looking exactly into what may cause MPNs so um, we're looking for patients for that who have been diagnosed in the last two years um, and it's what we call an epidemiological study so and um, once you consent then there are a number of things that would happen you um, have a long interview with somebody who's a trained epidemiologist that takes lots of details about where you grew up and what jobs you've done and, and tries to get all of that they also try and get you to get a find a friend so that you have somebody who doesn't have an MPN and um, but that also can answer those questions as a sort of compare so they get this big comparator group as well yeah. to compare you against and then you also give a blood test and um and some toenails so um i can't explain the toenails but um but it, it, that allows us to um basically assess toxins so that's the reason for the two-year cutoff so that that your toenails will show what you've been exposed to in the last two years so that's also to try and add to that information but yeah big study mosaic study so um yeah currently recruiting so Fascinating, important, important work. And that might answer those questions. I'm going to lead into a provocative one. That's a question there that's always quite frequently asked. Are MPNs a form of cancer? Yes, yes, absolutely. So neoplasm is a word that means cancer. So and these conditions there, um, they've got these genetic mutations associated with them. Um, and uh, so so we know that there are drivers, as in many other cancers, we know that these conditions can, in just some cases, um, move on to leukaemia, but they're not a leukaemia. So although you're called leukaemia care, the, 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 the cancers are not leukaemias, but they are a type of bone marrow cancer. But there's something that can be controlled and that you can live with. And as I've said, can can you can have a close to normal lifespan with the majority of these when they're well controlled. Um, so, so yeah, but we do have to call them a type of cancer. So the, the, the reason for that question was obviously from a classification point of view with regards to patients' access to um, equitable rights things of that nature yes. all of that completely um pertains for all of the mpns yes for definite okay. that, that's great news um i guess with the news of today i just want to finish maybe on two questions um if you can put your um, um crystal ball out um we got wind recently of some research developments i mean at the moment, my understanding is that none of the MPNs are considered curable. Um, There's a question that was asked, but how, how, what does the future hold with regards to treatment developments? Yes, yeah, so so there are pretty much MPNs can't be cured. I mean, I guess you know they're uh, curable but manageable and obviously yeah. impact on, on life. I mean, stem cell transplant for those life patients with myelofibrosis, you might say, is aiming to be a curative um, sort of impact. But um, so, what do I see as the future? I think it's I think in terms of myelofibrosis, I think that's where we've got the majority of input in terms of. Um, of research, but the, there is also some really important research in polycythemia vera as well. So um, there are drugs being developed for PV that actually just literally control the red blood cell production. So they actually sort of switch off um, the, the sort of drivers for the red, red blood cell production in a completely different way to anything that we've had before. So, so those drugs, I think whenever a drug's developed, though, it's a little bit like with the ruxolitinib and the time it's taken to get that through for approval and funding, it's always going to be, you know, the sort of cost benefit analysis when these yeah. things come up. So but certainly for PV, um, there, are, there are things really on the horizon and really exciting stuff coming out at the meetings at the moment. Um, for myelofibrosis, again, so much coming through. And I think that's where there's the, the kind of the richest um, sort of uh, field in terms of looking at different agents. I'd say looking at combinations. So we're looking at JAK inhibitors and then looking at combinations with other things. So um, I'm 
I currently have a trial that's looking at a combination of the drug called Navitaplax. Um, so that may well be something that runs. But then you've got other um, drugs that work in different ways, um, sort of different uh, types of approaches. Which one will win out? I guess that's the million dollar question. That's why we do trials. But yeah. but certainly there will be combinations on the horizon. Um, will we find something that will stop progression that's that's a big thing and there's a huge amount of work going on um for example colleagues in um oxford are looking um and and have, have recently published some very exciting data looking at um something called tp53 in the mutation and if we can really lock into that you know that's the sort of real blue sky thing is can we lock into these genes that go wrong at the later stages and actually turn things around so that that would be my my big blue sky hat on but yeah so but exciting things to come well, that's a positive, a near, a near positive, a near end note, but a positive one. Um, I was going to ask you about side effects, and um, interestingly, somebody's popped a question in about managing side effects. I guess that's something for both of you to answer there. Um, I think somebody's uh, been asked, raised a question um, about some advice on how can you manage potential side effects of peg, peg interferon. Uh, somebody's been struggling with but after already a reduced dose um, have you got any advice in general about managing symptoms of, of any of the agents of any treatment agents or especially this one lisa shall i pass that one to you and then yeah i mean i think the most important thing is to you know track your symptoms uh, talk to your team about them um, we keep coming back to some of the very common ones in terms of, you know, fatigue, particularly for people that we don't have magic wands and we don't have pills that we can give for fatigue. But there is an awful lot of work we can do. Again, it does take a lot of commitment from patients to get on board with learning about how to manage fatigue. It's, it is very difficult for people to adjust to having these disorders long term and uh, accepting that that these aren't curable and that they are going to have an impact on their lives. So. You know, it does need quite a lot of psychology input again and, and fatigue management to try and help people with those. Um, I can see in the comment that they mentioned about taking medications pre. So I, I think it's going to come down to what side effects they're actually having as an individual that's asking that question and going back to their team and talking those through if they're still struggling. But there are often adjustments, sometimes additional medications that are required, etc. But if it is back down to those um, itching fatigue and you know, all those things that are causing problems then you know keep coming back to us and talking to us and we'll do our best to try and limit them as best we can that's great and that's i think great. No, i think it's specifically mentioned interferon i think on one of the questions and i think yeah. that's it depends really what symptom there is but i think i, I describe interferon really with patients as being a bit like marmite some patients really get on with it, love it, but I'd say about a third of patients really don't get on with it. Mm. Um, and I think there's a little bit about dose reduction, and certainly we can take um, we can take the doses down to. And I've got patients on once every three weeks, once every four weeks, and that's really helped with some of the the side effects for some patients while still attaining good control. Um, of the blood counts or using it in combination with other things to take the dose right down with small doses and other things so yeah it's, it's, it's that it's that nuances of, of just altering a treatment to get the very best for you because everybody is very much an individual with NPMs. Well thank you both uh, massively and I've got a few slides to share and I'll just end on the no stress comment because I think that's really appropriate you know some of the um, self-help management um, strategies you shared in your slides, Joanna, around mindfulness and health and well-being. And mm -hmm. I think the message that has just been left there with regards to the significance of overstress in conditions. So I think it's been a really lovely, you've given lovely talks and in such a um, peaceful, pleasant way and really clear way. So I'd like to thank you so much for, for giving your time to do that. I'm going to see if I can technically... Uh, uh, Although we've overrun by a few minutes, I think we delayed by a few minutes because of some unfortunate technical areas. Just to let everybody know that um, I've got some slides that will share that we've got future upcoming um, MPN National Support Group meeting and a PV meeting that are following on from this webinar to open up some further discussion. But if you could bear with me a second, I'll just see if I can just find slides. Um, 
Aha. Let's see if I can get things to work for me. So I'll just run through a few of our services and uh, some dates with you. There we go. I think, can you see those? Uh, yeah, that's excellent. Um, so some service available from Leukemia Care. Uh, webinars such as this webinar are something that we do on a uh, fairly frequent basis across the different disease indications and sometimes topical. So it's been a pleasure today on um, MPN Awareness Day to be able to actually share an information, a broad oversight information about understanding MPNs and the great news about um, approval of a treatment today in, the, in, in England and Wales. So that's fantastic news. Um, and that will be in our newsletter, which is next on the list in our magazine, I'm sure. I'm sure that comms will be jumping all over this at the moment and pushing that out. Um, for those that might to, you know, listen whilst they're carrying out activities, we do um, really regular podcasts, and those can be accessed through the website. We're very active on social media, and I'm sure we'll see the TomToms are already out there today. I've had a glance at social media. It's buzzing with all, all everything MPN today. And the website is full of information, so it's well worth a visit because you can access just about everything uh, and all of our services through the website itself. Um, booklets, patient information booklets are invaluable, not just for yourselves, but to be able to visit when you want to, or to share with your family members and to other people that um, maybe don't quite get their head around what, what you're struggling with. So, you know, please visit the website, have a look through different books. So genetic books, uh, ge generic books to help living with the diagnosis, to help living with, um, you know, broader aspects of, 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 of a blood cancer. Um, but um, yeah, those are available across all disease and indications and especially in, um, uh, in the MPNs. Support services. Uh, Sophie uh, and, and the helpline uh, and um, a WhatsApp service is also available. So there's always somebody at the end of the phone. If there's anything you want to talk or you want to get information, or if, you, if you're not able to reach somebody in your care team, just, just pick up the phone. And if you're not somebody that likes to talk on the phone, we offer a WhatsApp, ser uh, a WhatsApp service. Um, virtual support groups, we have a national network of local disease-specific um, or uh, topical groups. Um, those are on the website. You can search by different type of group. It's always a great way to actually cope and live with the diseases, meeting other patients and being able to share with those that get it. So it's something I would always advise you do. I'll come on to some details on, as I touched earlier on the follow on uh, webinars. Obviously, we're offering welfare advice, advocacy support. Sophie's in support, actually, um, in, in the back room at the moment. I've seen her in chat, chatting to people. Um, you know, Sophie's there, she's amazing. So if there's anything you want help with, give her a call. Yeah, she's there for you. Online forums, um, Facebook groups, and most importantly, the Body Scheme, which I'll touch on a bit more, and the counselling fund that we offer to help um, when you're looking to deal with potential psychological challenges at various stages. Um, so I'm just touching on follow-ups to today's meeting. Um, on Thursday 21st, we've got, so that's only, um, what is the date today? It's not, it's it's less than two weeks away. Um, the MP, well, actually it's two weeks today, is it? No, it's one week today. One week. One, my gosh, time is flying, isn't it? Apologies. Yeah, so, so you know, support groups are a great opportunity. This video um, will be shared um, with all attendees. Uh, you can really visit it and actually just go into a bit more detail with a bit of peer support and you can chat. It's an open environment where you'll be able to talk to others and you're not behind the chat. Um, so it's you know well worth visiting. Um, I'm not sure who will be supporting that, but I have a feeling it's somebody from your team, Lisa. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, then uh, on the 4th of October, we've got the PV National Support Group. And I think Kirsty Crozier is supporting that one. So again, those are groups well worth visiting. And these are following on from the, you know, from the, the video. The video will be recorded and will be available on the website and on the YouTube channel. And it'll also be putting, have to be put in Facebook because unfortunately we haven't been able to stream to Facebook today because of a Zoom error. Um, buddies, buddy schemes, always, always a great opportunity. Being able to connect with somebody that's living with the same condition, that may be living with similar experiences, 
Um, we've got a broad range of buddies, and especially in the M MPNs. If you're somebody that's interested in helping others because you've been living with the condition and you practice for a long time, then please get in touch with us, or vice versa. If you're somebody that's desperately searching for a buddy to learn a little bit more from somebody else, that's, you know how they're coping and living with the condition, um, please get in touch. Um, I've talked about Sophie. The wonderful Sophie is there for you, but also um, our welfare officer is also there for you. So if you're struggling to pay bills or if you're having issues, um, you know, with cost of living at the moment, please do get in touch. Um, and I touched on earlier that we, we have the Anash, uh, the Anashley Counselling Fund that will offer six paid council sessions with an approved councillor. Um, so, you know, that's something that's available at any point, um, newly diagnosed or any point in, 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 in your journey. So, um, you know, that's something that's very valuable. I could attest myself as a patient. I definitely lent on somebody in counselling for six, you know, six sessions when I was going through chemo. Um, very helpful. Um, active on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'm repeating myself. Um, always up for anybody that wants to step up for a little bit of fundraising, community fundraising, any fun activities that you can do that raises a few pence or pounds, keeps us all going, keeps everybody supported. So if you could help with that, most appreciated. Um, and I'll just leave this up. Um, there's our help nine number for those that do reach out or are struggling to get the support they need. Please pick up the phone or alternatively email us at the support address and Sophie and team will be those that pick up those calls. And I'll just let that leave that up for a few more seconds while I find my cursor, which I managed to do. And on that note, I shall stop sharing my screen. And just like to say a second thank you to you, Lisa, and to you, Joe, for being fabulous panelists. And listen, thank you, everybody in the audience as well, for uh, for being such sports and um, being so participants. And I hope you found the event quite useful. And you'll be able to revisit this. If you are not sent it, it'll be on the website. Um, so have a lovely evening, everyone. Um, Bye, all. And, um, and, and, and a good future. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank we'll see you, you on the 21st. You will. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.